officially welcome you all here. This is a wonderful crowd, wonderful turnout, obviously a very important uh, topic and one that has a high degree of interest, so we want to get started and, and give our uh, our expert panelists a lot of time to talk. Um, I want to first start, though, um, by thanking our folks here today. Absolutely delighted uh, to welcome you to the Texas Wesleyan campus, uh, to the Nick and Lou Martin University Center, and the Paul and Judy Andrews ballrooms. I told um, I, I, I told Chris that um, when we built this building back in 2019, we specifically wanted to have a really nice venue like this ballroom for outside groups to come in because we know how great this campus and this community. Um, are, but we wanted to make sure that everyone in the Fort Worth community knew how wonderful this neighborhood is, and so this is an opportunity for us to bring folks in, and the collaboration with the Fort Worth Report has been just uh, phenomenal. Um, I want to say, uh, take a point of personal privilege here, because this is, after 12 and a half years, this is my last official, uh, this is my last day in the office, and I look out over the roof and I see so many people who have been so helpful to Texas Wesleyan University over the last 12 years, and I want you to know how grateful I am and how grateful the entire university is for all our community support. As we've talked to um, the candidates who came in for um, the, to be the next president of the university, um, I made sure they understood that I thought that Fort Worth was the greatest asset that Texas Wesleyan has, and the kind of community engagement that we have been able to do collaboratively with everyone uh, in the area has really helped this university thrive. Um, and so I know that the board of Texas Wesleyan is committed to continuing that community engagement, and the staff and the faculty here are as well. Um, and, and Glenn Lewis, who is the chair of our board, Glenn, would you stand and, and uh, be recognized, has done a fabulous job. of leading the board and of leading the search process for the next president. And I know that there will be a burst of enthusiasm and excitement when the next president begins July 1. Um, and I encourage all of you to stay connected to Texas Wesleyan. Thank you all so very, very much for everything. Thank you. He's a tough act to follow, isn't he? Well, we're... we're, we're Really, again, just want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, we solicited questions from people in advance and, and provided those to our panelists so that they could incorporate those into the discussion because we know a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about Panther Island, so we're really ready to jump right into it. I um, want to also thank our sponsors. We can do this, this free event without our sponsors. Uh, our silver sponsors are Bennett Partners, Prosperity Bank, the Real Estate Council of Greater Fort Worth, and the Rios group. And so all of our sponsors, though, really make this happen. Uh, we also want to thank, uh, we have an interesting new partnership today with Southwest High School who are live streaming this for all the people who couldn't make it into the room today. And we had a lot of people who <laughs> wanted to come. So we'll, this will is being live streamed on our YouTube channel, and we'll have a recording of it on our website, fortworthreport.org, well, along with the news coverage. So look, look for all that. We also um, have reporters working on uh, some in-depth stories about Panther Island and sort of comparisons to the Riverwalk in San Antonio, what's possible in Fort Worth and lessons learned. So look for all that coverage to come as well. Uh, but I want to get right to it because we've got a lot, a lot of ground to cover. I introduce uh, Michael Bennett. Um, if you sort of look anywhere around Fort Worth, you're likely to come across um, 
a project planned or designed by architect Michael Bennett. He's a native Texan. I got to know soon after arriving in Fort Worth. Uh, he's devoted his career to the redevelopment of cities and the preservation of the natural environment. After beginning his career in Texas, Michael spent 12 years practicing in Europe in New York before returning to Fort Worth, joining Bennett Partners in 2004 and becoming CEO in 2008. And uh, well, I'm just going to turn it over to Michael and let him introduce our panelists. Thanks so much. I'm supposed to put this little guy on, so I remember to do the one thing I was asked to do. So I think we may have a couple of slides here uh, of, of an intro to the project, if we could tee those up. But uh, the four panelists here, uh, Andy Taft, and I'm going to spend a lot of time introducing so I think you guys know most of these people. Andy Taft, is, is, uh, he, he came to Fort Worth about the same time I returned to Fort Worth and has been leading downtown Fort Worth, Inc. since then. And been happy to work with Andy on a number of things, and, and certainly done a great job, Andy. Dennis Chiesa is a friend of mine who is a uh, professor at UTA and an architect. Uh, Dennis is a, a North Side product, and has spent a lot of time with his studios, uh, introducing uh, them to to the Panther Island project, and and getting some student ideas about what could happen there and how it could happen. Uh, Susan Alanis uh, and I have worked together also a long time uh, when she was at the city on a number of things. I remember Susan being very helpful on Sundance Square and Sundance Square Plaza. And so Susan is, is now with Tarrant County uh, College and happy to be continuing to work with her there. Uh, last but not least, Aaron is with uh, HRA and A. They are our consultants who we have brought in to help us rethink this. Uh, we got proposals from a number of people. And I think HRNA was kind of the clear favorite. Aaron, you are the sacrificial consultant today. <laughs> so we are going to ask you the most difficult questions as we proceed. Uh, so right just out. get ready for that. Maybe run and get another cup of coffee while I do this quick intro. I'm assuming that's coffee. It is. Uh, and just coffee. Right? Uh, you see on the screen there a, a report that was published uh, not long after I, I came back to Fort Worth. Uh, this was a report that my old firm, Gideon Toll, uh, the, the, the predecessor, were the same company but previous names. Uh, and so I was introduced to this project by James Toll when I joined the firm in June of 2004. And one of the first things he took me over to do was over to Tarrant County College's offices in May Owen Center. And locked away in a couple of rooms in almost a closet was a model of the, the, the plan that the college had to, to build a campus to span the river. And that was an idea that grew out of the what was then called Trinity River Vision. And I looked at that and I thought, these people are crazy. And, and sure enough, they were proven crazy, not because they weren't able to do it, because they would have been able to do it. Uh, but a hurricane in, in New Orleans, uh, hundreds of miles away, had the Corps of Engineers kind of change their view of, of levees and how levees work. And so this plan, though, when you looked at it, and those were the I'm not going to read all those, but those were the, the kind of objectives of the plan. Uh, and I, as I look at those, as I was thinking about those as we were getting ready for this, they seem still very relevant, I think, in many ways to what we're talking about. And I think in some ways they have mostly survived the, the almost 20-year interim. And the plan had ideas, big ideas, like how you connect uh, core areas of Fort Worth, downtown, the cultural district, the north side. Uh, how, you, how you use this Trinity River uh, vision piece to be the connector of those and using water to be the connector. The plan was also, although it, it, you see the light kind of tan area, that was uh, a more commercial area, but it was those, those brown areas were more heavily residential. Uh, while they were mixed-use buildings, they were intended to be more heavily residential. The yellow bit was Tarrant County College's uh, uh, campus. Uh, they still own that land, and that's something we'll talk about today. And then, you know, things happened. Things got difficult, and that's what happens with lots of projects. But the Katrina thing was really a, a complication for the college's project, uh, but also sent federal resources other places. And so that difficulty continued, as you remember, the, the bridges and things like that. But things finally did get better. And so we're now in a spot where uh, the funding is there. Uh, and it's been a long time. I've, I've been back here uh, this next month, 20 years. And so a lot's, a lot's gotten done and a lot's changed in 20 years. 
And so that's really what we want to talk about today is we are who we are today, but what do we do moving forward? Uh, I'm going to leave that up there for a while if that's okay with you guys. That's a, that's a kind of core of engineers diagram that I think describes the plan really well. So as we talk about some of this stuff, I'd encourage you to kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, and that has dates attached to it, so you'll see that a lot of stuff is going to be happening and getting going in the next couple of years. It's been in design and been designed for quite some time. One of our criteria to the consultant team was that there's a basic plan in place. There's a lot of engineering that's been done, and so there are some things that we don't want to change, that we, we don't want to go back. We want to only go forward here. Uh, so I'll leave that up and get started, get started with the questions. <clears throat> Any questions from you guys? before, because I get to ask the questions, so this is your one chance. Okay. Um, Aaron, uh, in my work, I often hear the phrase, let the market decide, when it comes to considering how to proceed with a development. While this may be the quickest way to get a project on the ground and making money, it's not always the best way uh, for, for the city. It, in my mind, it advocates uh, city planning to the whims of the market. Um, in your, in your work, have you seen a way to thread the needle between doing what the market wants to do and, and what's best for the city and what, what, what gets us the most opportunity going forward? Thank you, Michael, and thank you. Uh, I'm honored to be here and honored to be a part of this uh, important project for the city of Fort Worth and for the region. And um, I think you know, that, that balance between um, between control, between flexibility, and balancing to what extent um, plans are prescriptive versus flexible to the market and, and to the changing conditions over the decades that these types of projects um, are implemented is, is, is crucial. And I think to be thinking about it at this moment where sort of a new we've turned on this project and a new opportunity to, to have this forward-looking perspective. Um, it is very much part of the, the thinking we're trying to do on this project and the discussions we're trying to have. I think um, you know, we're, we're at this moment on, on the Panther Island project to um, really be able to realistically think about how you do leverage the, the major investment that is already in progress as a foundation for, for economic development. Um, and there are you know, there are tools that can be used and that have been used to help define what Panther Island can be. There's planning, there's zoning, there's, um, you know, there's, there's the, the opportunity associated with the ownership um, held by public entities. And I think what we've learned from our work, we've, we've worked on these um, transformative major public-private projects across the country. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it really does tie back to being grounded in a vision that has consensus, that has buy-in, that people understand, um, and that has principles and foundations that help decision makers know, you know, the direction that this project needs to go and what to say yes to, but also what to say no to. And if you look at some projects, I'll, I'll go back to um, the Anacostia River waterfront in D.C. Some of you might have um, visited there when, you, when you've been to D.C. in the southeast uh, part of the city. It's 400, over 400 acres of waterfront land used to be industrial and military uses. And in 2003, there was a, um, it, 2003 is when a, a framework plan for that project was approved. We're you know, 20, 20 plus years out from there, and I think you've seen it become a buzzing new district in the city. When people go to DC today, it's part of the city fabric, it's part of the, the growth of the city. And I think what, you've, what you see there is a few things related to the question of flexibility and, and definition and letting the market take it, which is the role of the public sector and, and the role of um, the upfront vision and, and community vision for a project that can help define what it becomes over time. If you look back at the framework plan from 2003, I think a lot of it still stands, but the phased implementation and how you adjust to the market over time is crucial. And in that case, it was about, you know, how do you sequence the public space, the real estate, and some of the big anchor amenities. Um, it was about how do you bring in partners who are capable and committed and, and will stick around for the long term. Um, and how do you, you know, set up the tools to, to be able to see that vision through. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's important to be able to be flexible in that when market downturns occur, when things change, um, need to be able to be responsive to that, but always grounded in something 
um, you know, look back to that that vision that you you worked so hard on, and it were for Panther Island working to help update with with and distill the vision of, of the community and the stakeholders. Be able to look back at that and say, you know, this is consistent with that, but we were flexible enough to be able to respond to changing conditions over time. Great, thanks, uh, Susan. I'll go down the line and ask you the next question. Uh, based on that plan that, that we started with uh, 20 years ago, Tarrant County College bought a lot of land on both sides of the Trinity, uh, if I recall some 34 acres or something like that total, if I remember the number correctly. A lot of that's under a levee, some of it is even under the river as I recall a little bit. Uh, but since you then bought the Radio Shack campus, a lot of that land is now not needed for you unless you have other, other needs for it. Does it does the college district currently have other thoughts on how that property might be used, or what is your your current strategy for deciding what to do with that property? So, interestingly, we just presented to our board of trustees last fall a revised facility master plan, and, and part of it was looking seriously at the Trinity River campus. And there's actually room for two more towers off on, on the south side of the river for um, any growth needs that are there. So there is not an anticipated need for the college to develop that property. And so it really does pose an interesting um, possibility for us because uh, obviously we're, uh, we're workforce development. That's what we do. And so having a robust Fort Worth is, a, is an interest of ours. Um, and uh, the opportunity to be able to leverage the publicly owned land to be a catalyst project potentially for all of this um, uh, this work that's happening with the plan, I think, is, is really exciting. Our, our board has been um, very supportive of that. Obviously, um, we don't have a need to dispose of the property immediately, so it puts us in a good position to be a good public partner. Um, it's a value to our constituents, um, and the constituents of the college and the taxpayers as well, because um, increasing the, the, um, the economic vitality of Fort Worth is really core. Cool. So, um, again, our, our plans right now are on the south side of the river, and we've got plenty of room to, to grow there and expand our presence downtown. Great, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Dennis, most of the attention regarding Panther Island has, has really been on the main part of the island and the bypass channel and, and sort of that plan that we usually see. But as you see from the plan that's up on the screen, uh, there are a lot of other areas around the city that are that are impacted by that. Um, as, as the project uh, starts to accelerate and development starts to happen, there's a great likelihood that neighborhoods adjacent to Panther Island will also be impacted in, in different ways. As a product of the North Side and someone who spent a lot of time studying this in your in your design studios, uh, what impacts do you imagine the project could ultimately have on, on the North Side? Thanks, Michael. And thank you for having me here today. Thanks for being here. Um, so I grew up in the North Side and, and I, you know, going through architecture school, I, I was like, okay, this is going to be great, a lot of opportunities, and I'm sure architects are going to do really well, uh, developers, everybody in the, in the, in the city. Uh, I think there, you know, when I started studying the, the plan that Michael showed, the, the report, um, and some of the reports from the uh, the analysis of, of the project. One of the goals was to have something that really connected, and Michael mentioned this at the beginning, the major attractions of the city, right? So downtown, the stockyards, cultural district. But you know, it, it's sort of ironic that an island would be the thing to do that, right? Which is sort of a exclusive by definition, right? And it separates the chunk of land from the rest of the city. And so so if 20,000 people are going to come live and work in this island, uh, some of them, uh, I my thought was, okay, well, this is going to have an impact on the adjacent communities, the north side, which are, uh, you know, it's my, where I grew up, so I'm very fond of it. And, and I thought, okay, well, so what's going to happen with the people that want to be near Panther Island and all the amenities that are there but don't want to live in an apartment building, right? And so that means that they're going to probably live <clears throat> to the north side, riverside, and some of the areas next to that. And so to, I think housing uh, and the pressure on housing is going to be maybe the number one impact, which is already happening. Uh, second, I think, is uh, the impact in terms of small businesses that uh, come out of communities like the North Side and Poly and some other places uh, that are maybe driven or, or by small scale commercial spaces. Uh, and if we look at North Side, for example, 25th Street, Azel Avenue is a neighborhood co uh, commercial corridor, which is, has been pretty successful for 
generations. Uh, and so if, if uh, I think there's the, the opportunities and maybe challenges about how businesses that come out of these communities will, you know, thrive. And so, what impact the, the you know the larger density, the the the, heavy, the more dense plant island will have on, on those communities? I think it's, it's a question that that we have. And then finally, you know, you know, the in terms of identity, the Northside has a strong Hispanic Mexican American identity, and so um, and there's a history in, in in the island that doesn't get talked to, about much. You know, it, it is a site where. You know, Douglas Park was a place where Juneteenth was celebrated in the 1890s. Uh, McGard Park, uh, where uh, African American uh, baseball leagues played. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, neighborhoods like, uh, uh, you know, the, the Trinity River Bottoms, uh, 1012 North Main, which is just on the other side of, of, of where the, the bypass canal is going to be. Uh, La Corte, which is on the other side next to the uh, bluff or was uh, on, 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 by the courthouse. And so there's all these places that were really were places for uh, Hispanic and African American people. And, uh, and how do we then acknowledge that there was a history here, uh, especially in terms of public space. And so I think, you know, how this place becomes inclusive of some of those communities of around uh, Panzer Island is going to be a, a, a question and whether the people from the north side will have a, an opportunity to be able to to stay and to feel like they're a part of, of this new development and how the city grows. And and so I think the city will have some um, challenges and, and maybe some responsibility, I think, in providing uh, mechanisms to allow some of those residents to be able to stay uh, in, in their neighborhood, right? And, and that means not just development, but also policies that encourage and, and incentivize, um, you know, people staying in, in the neighborhood. Great. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, by the way, Dennis is wearing a boot, but he did not injure himself related to this panel today. It's, it's, uh, it was basketball. It was uh, basketball. Because my body is still, my mind thinks I'm 20. <laughs> my body is said no. <laughs> Which I told Dennis is a, is a passage to middle age. That's, that, that awareness. Uh, Andy, uh, DFWI has done a really great job under your leadership managing things like the downtown TIFFs, the, the PIDs, which, which take care of security, which take care of cleaning things up, the ambassador program, which which really helps helps people visiting Fort Worth feel comfortable and, and know where to go. Uh, do you see any role for downtown Fort, Fort Worth, Inc. in Panther Island as it moves forward? Do you see a similar role maybe being possible for that part of the city? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, first of all, downtown Fort Worth Inc. has been a supporter of the Panther Island project. It's transformative for all of Fort Worth, and, uh, and, it, and it will change what Fort Worth means to the world if we do it right. Uh, and, and by virtue of that, it will have a material effect on the success of our historic center city, uh, which since World War II has been in decline. Uh, with the exception of the last 30 years, we've really started to we've really started to pull it out, and uh, all of the development that you see in the near near South Side and in downtown, and uh, going to the West now and, and the North Side, is evidence of how the center city of Fort Worth is is roaring back. Um, the 800 acres or so of the two islands that we consider when we talk about the center city project. Um, it, it'll take a while to get there, obviously. Uh, we're about 175 years old here in Fort Worth, and fully a third of downtown Fort Worth isn't built out. And so uh, we're adding a lot of inventory of developable land that used to be commercial and industrial, and, uh, and, and now it's going to be waterfront. And I think it will be extraordinarily attractive. And the people and the new uses and the new users that are going to be coming into Panther Island are going to generate the need for enhanced maintenance and security of the sort of sorts of things that, that we do in downtown. So whether or not downtown Fort Worth Inc. Um, does the work in the form of a new public improvement district, which would, I, I would guess, um, would be something that the property owners of that area would look, would look for, somebody will probably need to do that work. 
And it's important to remember that public improvement districts are largely a, uh, a creation of the private sector, uh, where the base city standard uh, levels of service uh, want to be enhanced. And the property owners gather together, they sign a petition, they charge themselves an extra amount in their taxes to provide these extra levels of service. Um, there are a number of very successful public improvement districts in downtown. Uh, I'm a little biased, thinking that the downtown one is a, is a high-performing one. And uh, I think it would be very interesting for downtown Fort Worth Inc. to be approached to, at, at the right time uh, to see whether or not our expertise in that would be uh, appropriate and desired. Um, but whether we are the group uh, that does it or not, the idea of an enhanced level of service and care in that area is something that I would I would I would put some serious money on the fact that uh, that that will want to be done. Yeah, it will be a timing issue as well because today there's not enough property there to really make that work. So you're going to have to have some some uh, so, sort of base level to be able to make it make sense. Yeah, not enough base property value. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would look to the near south side as an excellent example of probably the next big public improvement district that needs to be created. Uh, and the new apartments and the office buildings and hotels and whatnot that are being built in that area that's dominated by uh, nonprofit hospitals that don't pay taxes uh, yet generate a lot of need for these enhanced services, uh, they're getting to the point where uh, a public improvement district can do some real good. And that, that might be a good example to look at as we look at the, the evolution of Panther Island as a development. I think uh, West 7th also is going to have a public improvement district discussion soon, but yeah, that's, that's another panel another great discussion at a, at a different time. Aaron, it's back to you. And I think Andy has bourbon in that glass, by the way. I that's, do. I don't think that's apple juice. <laughs> that was way to scale 20. <laughs> that was way too good of an answer for you. That must be bourbon in that glass. Uh, okay, Aaron. Uh, I've kind of gotten myself off my game here. Give me a second. Uh, with the framework of the master plan established and since the design and construction is underway in some areas, the focus of the, the, focus of the plan is going to shift soon to implementation. Uh, as, as, as some of us in the Real Estate Council were looking at this, we consulted with the former mayor of Pittsburgh, Tom Murphy, who oversaw the redevelopment of Pittsburgh's waterfront at a time when, when Pittsburgh was very different from, from Fort Worth today. Uh, Pittsburgh was losing population, Fort Worth gaining population. Uh, much like Fort Worth's waterfront, there was a lot of industrial stuff to be cleaned up, and kudos to to the water district for having really taken the lead and, and, and done the cleanup at Panther Island. But, but one of the things that Tom emphasized to us was the importance of implementation and having a good plan without anyone to implement it is, is a, a fail and we don't want to do that. One of his pieces of advice was make sure there is someone that wakes up every morning of every day uh, thinking, what do I do to protect and implement this plan? What are your thoughts on the implementation piece of this? Well, I, I couldn't agree more with the, the mayor's uh, statement and, and perspective there. I think the, the nature of these types of projects with the level of complexity that they have and needing to bring so many parties together, so many resources together um, over time, it really does require that dedicated focus, that um, sort of unrelenting uh, commitment to seeing a vision through. And I think, um, look, we're encouraged and, and very, you know, when, when we were coming into this project to see seven public and nonprofit entities coming together to say this is important to us um, and it's important that we work together and it requires all of us to begin seeing greater progress at Panther Island. Um, between the, you know, the city, the county, the water district, the college district, downtown Fort Worth Inc., streams and valleys, um, the real estate council. And so this level of upfront commitment right now in this moment of, of transformation and this moment of progress here is, is crucial. Um, at the same time, I think as you move to implementation, I'll say sort of two, two things to focus on. One, and you know, it's sort of why we are here and the work that um, our team is, is working on uh, in the coming, you know, this year and, and going into the coming months is um, 
I'll go back to having having a vision that uh, is is reflective of the current conditions, the potential future conditions, the realities of the project, and has the sort of vision and ambition that can that can uh, drive you know that, that can keep people focused on on the future, and um, is you know allows a, a group of stakeholders and all of the community and stakeholders to coalesce around a vision. I think. You know, in waking up every day, and you know who's waking up every day and driving a project forward. What what they're driving forward needs to be this visionary, this this thing that people can understand, um, and that is still grounded in the practicalities, and people believe it can be implemented. So, um, I think there's many examples of, of that, and and you've, we've we've seen many examples where, you know, by having that strong vision, and then who's responsible for that vision um, being clear, you can see see a lot of progress. The other piece I'll get to that I think is really important as it relates to implementation strategies, um, and I think this is really what the, the mayor of Pittsburgh was getting at, is responsibility and accountability. And um, you know that ties back to governance, that ties back to partnership, and I think it, it's something that we're going to be looking at in our work and working with the, um, you know, the, the client to, to work through, is how do you set up the structure for long-term stewardship of a project of the scale and complexity of Panther Island. Um, there's many examples of sort of organizations, entities, and partnerships that are, are you know, bringing the public and private sector resources and, and responsibilities and authorities together, um, from the Louisville Waterfront Development Corporation, the Cincinnati uh, Banks Public Partnership, which brought together the county and the city. Um, and the resources they had to help, uh, you know, begin transforming the waterfront um, around a set of anchor uh, uh, destinations and institutions. And in, in many of these cases, it's about a dedicated set of partners, dedicated uh, set of entities. And I'll just say, like, what are the elements you need to consider in doing that? It's uh, where is the funding and financing for the project coming from over time? Um, how are partnerships, you know, sort of formalized in a way that can go beyond the people in the roles and can, can survive um, over time, but, you know, grounded in, in, in the roles and responsibilities of each party? How can that entity be a coalition builder? Um, and how can, you know, engagement is something we're doing in our work, but engagement on a project like this needs to continue over the course of its entire um, implementation. And then I think the practicalities of who's doing what, who has what decision-making roles, um, you know, what tools are being brought to bear by which party and, and partner. And so all of these are complicated. I mean, it's not all going to be solved in the next six months. Um, but I think it's a really important question to be asking ourselves as, and all of us to be asking ourselves as we go about this work. Yeah, have a follow-up, Andy, for you a little bit. Uh, downtown Fort Worth Inc. has been successful, I think, largely because of the leadership of Downtown Fort Worth Inc. Of, Thank you. Uh, of Moldy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did I just take that glass away from me? <laughs> yes. Uh, I think largely because of that type of things leadership, though, there's a standard that everyone gets held to, and I think some of that's through the design guidelines that happen, the fact that those are are, are supported by downtown Fort Worth Inc. And, and I think the power of, of the TIF has also been another way that that, that, that gets ensured. Do you have any thoughts on, on what Aaron was just saying as well, as how, how this gets implemented? Yeah. Um, First of all, it's remarkable in many ways that the challenges that the Paper Island project, or the Center City project, uh, has had to overcome over the last 20 years, uh, that, that the community is stuck with it. And the community is stuck with it largely because the leaders of the community believe in the idea, in the big idea, right? Uh, and so that leadership, there's, there hasn't been a single person. Uh, it's been a collection of, of very strong civic leaders, both staff and elected officials, who have been championing this project all along because because of the value of the big idea, right? I think everybody in the room here understands how exciting the idea is. So um, having an organization like the SWI or the Near South Side of Camp Bowie Inc. and some of the others around town, the uh, Southeast Fort Worth thing, um, having an entity like that that uh, has purview over this, that helps uh, the public and private sector come together on a daily basis to overcome all of the challenges associated with any kind of um, development, let, much less center city infill development, it is going to be important. And, uh, and, and while you're talking about a tactic for leadership, 
the, the what that leadership is um, is wrapped around is this more refined vision of, of what this wants to become. Right? You, you're not going to buy into the idea of a landfill being on this eight hundred acres, right? This is a place. that actually has already happened there, so I think well, we can that box. <laughs> we go. But but what what the entire community needs to continue to have is a is a vision of the future that we're all going to be extraordinarily proud to show off and to uh, uplift ourselves and, and future generations. And that doesn't happen easily, you know. Um, there are economic and personal agendas at play and there has to be balance, uh, especially given how much of this land is waterfront and owned publicly. And so having a very strong leadership core uh, and an individual, and that individual is surrounded by a staff, coupled with a very strong vision that this community will take extraordinary pride in and look back on and say, we did something special here, uh, are, are two sides of the same coin. And we best not forget that we can very easily slip into saying yes to things that we will not be proud of because money might be the driving factor as opposed to the vision. And great things happen uh, when vision prevails. The money will follow a great vision, and people have to make it happen. That's well said. I wish I had said that. <laughs> well you said. might. <laughs> <laughs> I'll credit you the first time. Okay. Uh, no, that's consistent with, with a lot of what Tom Murphy said to us. Is that He talked about opportunities to have things like Home Depot built on the waterfront in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And they just said, no, that's not what we want to do. That's not the vision. We're not going to do that. Uh, Susan, a, a, a question for you, uh, again, about, about the College District's land holdings. Uh, the, the historic TXU generator building has been there and certainly the most iconic thing on the island and, and certainly visible and, and certainly a historic part of, of, of our city's history. And I, went, I had the opportunity to go through that building uh, 20 years ago. And it was at that point it was like a, 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 a time warp. It's like people left for lunch and didn't come back. It's a it's a hugely interesting and complex building. It's it's it was it was built around a generation process, and so it has very many different levels and, and very many different kinds of rooms. It's large, it's difficult, it's it's in a deteriorating position. And as somebody that works a lot with old buildings. You know, every every day that goes by, the building has one more little problem, and and so all that builds up. And so, I say all that to 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 kind of tee it up to ask if you have had any thoughts, or if the college district has had any thoughts about what to do with that building, uh, because if you develop it sooner, that's more beneficial that less things happen. But I could also put myself in the college district's shoes and say, but if I wait, it's going to be worth more. But if I do it now, it could be a catalyst project for this whole thing. So where is the college district with that today? Yeah. So, so let me start with um, something I actually learned yesterday, and she's in the room, Jerry Tracy, so I can quote her on this. I didn't realize, so San Antonio is first in the state in terms of historic assets, and Texas, or Fort Worth is number two. And when you think about what that meant to the downtown development and how interesting it is and what makes us unique, that's really, really critical. So I think all of us collectively value that um, moving forward. Um, interestingly, you can't even go into that building today because it's, it's too dangerous. And um, even to the, the planning team, we sent them a, a really great video of the interior of it, and, and they'll, they'll be able to look at the exterior. But um, that's how much it has deteriorated probably since you were allowed to go through it. Um, obviously, the college is not in the development business. Um, I think that that's why we are looking forward to the outcome of this plan, because it will help us understand what the possibilities are. Now, whether you can you know, realistically preserve the whole building versus selecting some facades that make it really an interesting project for the future, I think, is, is yet to be um, seen, and it will require the, the right developer to do that. Um, as I mentioned, when, when I learned about TCC's holding that property, I, I thought about us being a catalyst, and then reality met with the levy won't come down for eight years, the sequencing of all of that infrastructure for flood control that has to happen that makes it very complicated. However, one of the things that we've talked about is that there may be some opportunity for a patient developer to make improvements to some of the, um, the property, um, not directly adjacent to the levy, but plan for a longer term um, uh, engagement there that would allow us to 
accomplish both goals. But, but part of that is the work that we've engaged this team to do is to help us understand what the possibilities are and figure out collectively um, what we can do to partner to do that. The good news is it's a publicly held building, so it's not going to get knocked down, you know, tomorrow. We're, we're, um, uh, uh, the college is obviously partnering in, in all of this for a reason, and so um, we've got that going for us. But uh, but I think it's, it's a very complex question, but as we get through the, the planning exercise um, uh, that will turn into an action plan around that, it'll, it'll help us understand what the opportunities are. Um, I, I will say this, and this is, you know, I'm not speaking on behalf of the board, one of our trustees is actually here today, Mayor Bar. Um, but uh, I, I don't know that money today is the key driver. I mean, I think the college is a taxing entity, also has um, an interest in the long-term highest and best use of all property in the community, and including the, the property that we own. And so um, our, our uh, furtherance of that objective is not to take the, the first developer that comes along or, or, um, or be worried about that the, the value might grow later. I mean, we obviously have a fiduciary responsibility to con the constituents of, of Tarrant County College, but I think that this would, having that long-term view is, um, um, furthers that uh, on their behalf, so. Susan, you said something, patient developer, do you? Can you define that? I've not met yeah. one of those before. <laughs> that was sort of naive. And oh, actually, for all the historians in the room, uh, and I'm not going to remember his name, but the lighting um, element that used to be the, the little meter guy that was on Ready the Ready for what? Yes, yes, yes. We actually have that created at the college, and so we share that with the team of, you know, I wouldn't describe it as particularly attractive, but it is an interesting historic element of, of something that we can incorporate into, um, into the future. Yeah, when I toured that, it was he was actually boxed up in the in the basement of that yeah. building, but there was some restriction on using it because of a copyright that was owned oh. by somebody else in another city There's always in the Northeast. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. Um, Dennis, as, as you've gone through all the student design projects on, on this whole thing, uh, and, and my son just graduated from architecture school, so I know architecture students can have bizarre ideas and sometimes good ideas. <laughs> uh, has anything come out of all that that you think we should think about or consider? And no is a fine answer. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know if I would say they're wild or bizarre or, uh, I mean, not wilder than rerouting the river. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Something that's really unnatural, right? I mean, all my landscape architecture uh, friends and professors, they, they all think that this is so weird that we're going to reshape the river. Yeah, but we did that before. But we, yeah, so we, yeah, it, and so the, the student ideas are not, you know, super crazy. Uh, the, you know, I think, when, so when I give the assignment to the project to the students, we begin by understanding place, the history of the city, of the neighborhood at multiple scales, neighborhood, city, region. Um, and then they, I give them that, that report that Michael showed at the beginning, and it's okay, now read this and tell me what it's, what it's about. Uh, in the fall of 22, last uh, two semesters ago, uh, we had one student in, uh, that actually was from the north side. And so when they came back and they said, okay, this is what, uh, you know, we looked, we analyzed this thing and, and there's a marina there. And his response was, I don't have a boat. So, and I don't know anybody that has a boat in my family or my friends. So that marina, it's not for me. It's not for us. It's not for the people of Northside. And so I, he said, you know, how do we then create spaces where people feel welcome? And I think the conversation and the responses we heard from the panelists all sort of lead back, uh, I think, to this issue of public space uh, and how we are going to uh, manage, design, and provide spaces for people to use uh, and for people to feel welcome. Uh, and so I think, you know, first we've got to acknowledge that there's a history in this, in this area, you know, some of those places that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then I think the city has to sort of put its foot down and say, we're going to reclaim these things, these, some of these spaces, the waterfront, uh, once the levees are removed and say that this should be given to the, to the public. Um, most great cities have, uh, a great public spaces. The, uh, downtown Fort Worth is great because it's a network of public spaces, just like most great cities. Uh, you know, it's Sundance Square, it's the courthouse, it's Water Gardens, it's Burnett Park. It's these public spaces in a walkable neighborhood, right? Uh, 
and we see cities across the world that are, that, that work this in the same way. So then, what is the network of public spaces that's going to be in Panther Island? So some of the students, you know, uh, the one that comes to mind immediately is, is you, know, you know, they looked at the history. They said, okay, there was a community, a, a Hispanic uh, neighborhood, a barrio, and on the bluff of the of the courthouse, La Corte, okay, and then the north side, which is anchored sort of by uh, three great parks. Also, again, that neighborhood has Marine Park, the Rec Center, Rodeo Park, uh, J.P. Elder Middle School, uh, Circle Park, uh, and so these spaces, right, anchor the, the the neighborhood really. And there's a direct line of sight from the library and the and J.P. Elder Middle School, where I graduated from. Um, to the courthouse, and so then they said, "Okay, can we take the sort of the west edge of Panther Island and then dedicate that to public space, right?" And, and so instead of creating, you know, private developer uh, uh, sites or, or plots of land, uh, then maybe we dedicate the edge to the public, where amenities, things that are going to go away, like uh, uh, the flea market, which is used by a lot of people. You know, on weekends and other places that are smaller scale commercial spaces can we provide places for those uh, uh, businesses to, to thrive and and so then I think that the most radical thing that we could propose is to say you know we're going to reclaim some of these spaces and the that have a history and then and this land that's going to be uh, prime real estate and give it to the public and say they're going to be a, it's going to be a public park that maybe wraps the the uh, uh, around the island and uh, and that may be the most radical thing, even though it doesn't. It's not a building. It's not a crazy idea uh, in terms of form, or, or it's not spectacle. It's just sort of reclaiming public space for for the people. And I think uh, that actually would be benefit everybody. It would benefit the people that own properties that are going to develop some of this land. I think uh, you know I agree about you know TCC and and. The, they should prioritize other things other than just what generates the most amount of money because ultimately it, th this will generate money anyway. People, developers, hopefully have to figure out a way to make money and, and they'll figure, figure out a way to maximize the, the property, right, the real estate. So, so I think, uh, you know, the, the, how we reclaim some of that and how, you know, in the plan there needs to be ideas that are more inclusive and that allow people to, to actually feel comfortable being there. And I think right now, the, I'm not sure that's the case, at least in the previous version. And frankly, the, the part of the problem with the, um, with the plan, right, it's, you know, we can't sort of judge, the, you know, when it was created and, and the priorities were different. It was just about, you know, de attracting development dollars and, and creating and managing growth. Uh, but we're in a different, a different time, right? Especially in the last four or five years, after we become a lot more aware uh, about social injustice and social issues, uh, and so we have to look at this through a different lens, uh, maybe through a lens of equity, uh, and 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 that would be justified because our priorities as a as a society have changed, right? And so then we have to say, okay, then what do we need to do for uh, that really benefits most of the people in in the especially in the adjacent communities. Great, thanks. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, Andy, as I think back to 20 years ago, uh, as I think back to 20 years ago about the time you and I were both arriving, me back here and you here, uh, Fort Worth was a very different place. Downtown had, had several corporate headquarters, Radio Shack, uh, Pier 1, some, some things like that. Uh, all those, all those uh, sort of historic office buildings were occupied by people like XTO. And, and today, as I look at it, uh, it's a different place. Many of those historic buildings are now occupied by either hotels or apartments. Uh, we have, we're finishing up the first now new uh, high-rise apartment building in Fort Worth in Deco 369. Uh, we are adding lots of residential to downtown. And I wonder if, if that increase of of residential use in the existing downtown core changes your perception of the amount of residential that was foreseen in the original Panther Island plan? Uh, yeah, you know, the original Panther Island plan, if you, you, you all have an image of what that looked like. You might have seen I, I can go back that. if you want. Uh, most of the structures that you see there are um, envisioned to be um, multifamily. Maybe apartments or condos or townhomes or something like that. 
20 years ago, that was a wild idea. I mean, people were laughing that that many people would want to live in the center city of Fort Worth. 10,000 people? It was a stretch. Or 10,000 homes. Yeah, 10,000 residents. Yeah. Or, yeah, residential units. Uh, the amount of development that we have seen in downtown, the near south side, the north side, uh, the east side, all around downtown, uh, at the near south side, I would say, thousands and thousands of new residential units built where all of these jobs are, most of it at the very high end of the market, uh, almost all of it now at 95% occupancy with hundreds more in the pipeline, thousands more in the pipeline and hundreds more under construction right now. Uh, Fort Worth, the center city of Fort Worth, has finally reached a tipping point where the market finds it acceptable. Right? Not only acceptable, but highly desirable. 20 years ago, that was not the case. We were still in the nascent stages of selling the concept of people living in the core of our center city. So this idea of, of Panther Island uh, being a successful residential area, the idea, just the idea of it, is no longer a wild stretch. Uh, it can happen. The question now is, should it happen? Should that be the dominant land use, and should it be in that form necessarily? And, and I think that that's what this um, Panther Island um, uh, 2.0 uh, effort is going to help us help us decide. If you look at the Samuels Avenue corridor from uh, uh, on an aerial picture, it looks just like that. Samuel Avenue, they've added about 5,000 residential units, 3,000 3, residential units just on Samuels. 3,000 units just on Samuels. That is a microcosm of what Panther Island was going to be, and that development by Tom Strews uh, was, was based on the premise of Panther Island and the promise of Panther Island. So it is, it is demonstrable fact that it will work. It will absolutely work. Put, and none of that is on the water, by the way. It's about 80 feet above the water. Which gives it a nice view. Which gives it, it gives some people, the people on the front yeah. a great view. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but put, put water in the mix and a walkable urban environment that is shared by everyone. And I remember James Toll with great pride saying the entire waterfront will be accessible to the public. It's based on the Vancouver model of open space for everyone. Uh, Charleston is another really great example. Uh, put the power of water into the equation of the center city of Fort Worth between the stockyards and downtown, and you will have an extraordinarily highly um, uh, uh, attractive place for people to live. So your question is, how does all the development in downtown Fort Worth and residential around downtown Fort Worth affect Panther Island? I think the case is proven. Uh, the question is now, now that that land use is proven and proven desirable, uh, it takes a lot of speculation out uh, and, and it just makes it a matter of financing at this point uh, and market timing and anything else. And getting levies taken down and all that kind of little details. <laughs> Check. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to consider that done. Uh, it, it takes a lot of the questions out of it and leaves open um, uh, all of the other opportunities um, that are represented in all that land. And I would say just, if you want an example of patient, a patient developer, I would look to the Bass family. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And, and, and people of that wealth uh, are mirrored in Fort Worth uh, in, the, in their timing outlook and the availability of funding and the patience and the ability to be patient. They are mirrored by the public owners of the land in Panther Island. The public can be patient, uh, and public leaders can be patient. So it, it's, it's not like that parallel doesn't exist. No, don't take my quip as being that they don't exist. It's just a rare breed. Yeah, it's, it's a, a rare breed. But, but the Panther Island project is blessed, uh, blessed with the ability to have that flexibility. And I think if we can be more patient, we will see a bigger impact for what it gets delivered in eight years. Right. And if we have the ability to withstand the impatience of some. Correct. Within the context of a vision that we all believe in, we will be much happier than real. We have about 10 minutes left. I'll take them.
<laughs> I'm going to give you three minutes and 33 seconds. No. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. So, uh, and, and my kind of one last question here that I'd like each one of you to answer is that, you know, we've been at this by the time the levees or by the time the bypass channel is dug and, and everything gets going, we will have been doing this for 30 years and it will have cost more than a billion dollars. And so uh, my question to you all is after all of that time and effort and money, what does success look like in, in your minds? And what obstacles do you see to success? Aaron, you're the paid sacrificial consultant, so you have to answer <laughs> first. Well, I'll, I'll reflecting a little bit on, on what fellow panelists have said, I think, um, you know, success looks like a place that everyone in Fort Worth feels welcome, everyone in Fort Worth feels a reason to go there. Um, it is a place that is helping Fort Worth more broadly, you know, fuel and accommodate the growth that it's already been experiencing. Um, and I think, you know, going back to, to the earlier, uh, to the earlier comments, I think it's a place that if you look back, it's that you know, the vision, the consensus built vision, the community driven vision that was set out, you know, in, in, around this work um, sort of helps define a path and equip um, decision makers to, to see that path forward. And I think, um, you know, all of what, what everyone is saying about the importance of open space, the importance of place making, the importance of mixed use, all of these are you know, principles and, and ideas that are coming out of all of the conversations we've only just begun, and I think are a very exciting foundation and platform for, for a compelling vision um, that can go forward. I think in terms of obstacles, it comes down to the practicalities of um, what it takes to get these major projects done, and I think um, that's why it's this, you know, what, what I'm excited about about the work we're doing is it's the combination of updating the vision, but also thinking about the practicalities of the dollars, the practicalities of the roles and responsibilities, um, and you know, trying to match those two to help set the path, set the project on a path to, um, you know, what everyone in this room and outside this room can define as success. Susan, so I'm, I've been in government for nearly three decades, and I think it's it's easy to look at ROI and investments like these and be critical about how long and how difficult they are. But honestly, it requires government to persist in some of that vision to make it so. And if you look around the country and around the world, um, uh, uh, the places that you want to go and see and, and be, then, then it, it, it requires this. And so it can't just be looking at the dollars and, and was it worth it. I think it would have been an incredibly lost opportunity um, here in Fort Worth to know that we needed to replace our levees and to not think wildly about what other opportunities could coexist with that. Um, I, and, and I think that our, our success would be vitality, whether it's economic, whether it's cultural. I mean, those, those of us who've been in Fort Worth, um, and, and I would not, I'm not a fifth generation Fort Worthian, and <laughs> like, like probably some of the people in the room, but um, you know, you, you get it when you get here, I think is one of the taglines we have. And the opportunity to um, to be a more uh, you know an increasingly authentic place um, as we move forward is, is really important and and open to everyone. So um, you know, so like a lot of the other big projects, I mean DFW Airport. Um, you look at Alliance. I mean, some of that stuff looked bold and crazy and took a lot of time and a lot of public money and a lot of private money. Um, and, and now we look back and we're like, of course, right? And I think that this will be one of those projects that, um, that serves Fort Worth that way. Dennis? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I agree totally about what, what my fellow panelists have said. Uh, I think success, you know, maybe it'll be successful. Uh, I think for, for it to feel like a success from the perspective of of most people, it would mean that those people would have to be a part of the conversation uh, as the process sort of develops and the redesign of, of these things. And so, who's at the table and who gets invited to these things and these, you know, these conversations is important. As a, my example from my students and how they looked at the, the plan of, 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 of Panther Island, 
and their critique of it, right? And so how do we, if the spaces, the public spaces that are designed are welcoming and, and they're programmed in a way that, that people feel like they're, they can be a part of, I think that's gonna, that's one level of success. But really is in the process, uh, those that feel like they're part of the conversations, uh, conversation and they, they have buy-in into the, the process and the, the, how the project ultimately develops, I think they're gonna, uh, you're gonna get a lot less resistance um, and I think maybe that's where, where the work needs to be and how do we uh, make it more inclusive in the outcome but also in the process of developing these things, right? And, um, and I think that might be the, the, the only way that you will f get buy-in from some of these communities that have historically been marginalized, right? And that have been left out of the conversation. So. Andy, you have exactly your three minutes left. Excellent. <laughs> um, although I need a little time to close up here. I'm sorry. <laughs> about to abridge your remarks. <laughs> uh, so, first and foremost, the question is, what will success look like? <clears throat> uh, success will mean that Fort Worth has protected itself from devastating flooding. Let's be clear, the lion's share of the billion dollars you just talked about is a flood control project, and we are in jeopardy. So. We, we've talked about Panther Island and the excitement of beauty and uh, engagement and everything. We've got a flood control, control problem, and we need to fix that. So we fix that. Uh, the other is that the land above the water uh, will be much, that the people who are using the land above the water will be able to use the water. And so while they might not have a boat today, they might have a boat tomorrow in downtown Fort Worth. Uh, or they might have a canoe or a kayak or an inner tube and that the river itself becomes a part of the community in a much greater way than it is today. And if you look at great cities in America, their rivers play a prominent role. And we, despite everything we've done, we've still turned our back on our river. So it's this amazing asset that we need to leverage. On the land itself, we will have a place, success looks like a place that differentiates Fort Worth, Texas from the rest of the country and makes us a world destination. We ha I think we have that opportunity there. And so the combination of flood control, people on the river and using the river and making it a part of the community, and a place that differentiates Fort Worth and moves the economic and civic needle in our city on a global scale is what success looks like to me. Thank you, you can use that too. Okay, good. <laughs> I want to thank the panel. Thank you guys for taking time uh, to be here. Uh, I'd certainly appreciate it. And thanks, Fred Slaybach, for hosting us. Our firm designed this room, this building. We designed it for 350. I think we may have exceeded that today, so I would ask you not to all exit at the same time. <laughs> but, but thank you all for being here, and thank you for your interest and involvement in this project. And let's not let this wane. Let's, let's remain interested and remain involved. So thank you all. Have a good day.